little and often, little and often. This is one of the best approaches to long-term growth. So if you're trying to increase your English vocabulary, then you want to learn a small amount of new vocabulary on a regular basis. In this video, I have brought together five days worth of learning. On each day, we will explore five new pieces of vocabulary, all with an explanation, and then round it up at the end with a short story so that you hear all the vocabulary in context. Now, here are the timestamps for each day, so you can jump straight to whichever day you're currently on. Enjoy. This is your five a day, week 2.1. Number one on this week's list is a fantastic word, flummoxed, flummoxed. Say it with me, flummoxed. Oh, I love this word. This is an adjective and it means to be completely confused. Hmm, I'm flummoxed. Here's an example sentence. The difficult puzzle flummoxed even the most skilled problem solvers. Honestly, I'm flummoxed every single day. I put my phone down. I think I know where it is. I come back and it's not there. And I look around all the obvious places, but I can't find it anywhere. I'm absolutely flummoxed. What have I done with my phone? Okay, number two on the list is to wear one's heart on one's sleeve. So I often wear my heart on my sleeve. This is an idiom and this means to show your feelings, your true feelings openly and without stopping to think about it. So you have no doubts, you have no hesitation, you're just happy to show people how you feel. I'm very much like that. Here's an example sentence. She wears her heart on her sleeve, which makes it easy for others to know how she feels. Next up, we have a phrasal verb. Number three is to brush off. To brush off. Now, today's version of brush off is to dismiss or ignore someone or something in a casual and disrespectful way. So if I brush someone off, then I'm ignoring them in a way that's disrespectful. Or if you say something to me and I brush it off, I'm treating it like it's not important, whatever it is you just said. Here's an example sentence. He brushed off her concerns, saying that she was talking nonsense. So imagine you're having a terrible time at the office because you're very worried about a glitch in the system that's going to cause huge problems for the company. And you go to your manager and you say, I've got these terrible concerns. There's this glitch and it's going to cause all these problems and it's going to be, it's going to be a really, really big issue. We need to sort it out now. But your manager just disrespects you and says, huh, you're talking nonsense. Get out of my office. And he's brushing off your concerns. That's not very nice, is it? Okay, number four on our list is to empathize. Empathize. Say that with me. Empathize. This one might be a little bit tricky to say because you have a TH followed by an a Z sound. Thighs. Thighs. Oh, like your thighs, your upper leg, your upper legs, your thighs, to empathize. In American English, this is spelt with a Z. In British English, this is spelt with an S, but still pronounced like a Z. So to empathize, this is a verb and it means to understand and share the feelings of another person. Here's an example. As someone who has also lost a loved one, I can empathize with your pain and grief. Last on our list is melancholy. Melancholy. 
This is a lovely word. It's a noun. Uh, I say it's lovely. <laughs> I always use the word lovely when I'm describing sad words. It sounds lovely, melancholy, melancholy. It has a nice ring to it, but it means a feeling of sadness. Often when you're thinking about something from the past, melancholy. So an example would be the melancholy in her voice indicated that something was troubling her. Okay, so there's our five. Let's just quickly recap. We had flummoxed, to wear one's heart on one's sleeve, to brush off, to empathise, and melancholy. Now, it's time to bring them all together in a little story. Let's go. Alex sat at his desk, flummoxed by the maths problem in front of him. He had always struggled with numbers, but this was something else entirely. The more he tried to solve it, the more his frustration grew. He knew he needed help, but he didn't want to admit it. As he pushed his notebook away, Alex felt a twinge of melancholy settle in his chest. It was the feeling he got whenever he thought about his father, who had died two years ago. He missed him terribly. Alex decided to take a break and go for a walk. He walked down the street, lost in thought, until he heard a familiar voice calling out to him. Hey Alex, wait up! It was his best friend Jason, jogging to catch up with him. Alex turned to face him, feeling a little better already. Jason told Alex that he could tell something was wrong and that he was here to help, but Alex brushed it off as nothing, not wanting to admit he had a problem. They walked together for a while, talking about nothing in particular, until Alex finally worked up the courage to tell Jason that he found maths really difficult Jason had a lot of empathy for his friend as he knew what it was like to struggle in school. He said, I know a tutor who could help you out. He's really good and I'm sure he could explain it in a way that makes sense to you. Alex felt a wave of gratitude wash over him. He realised that he didn't have to wear his heart on his sleeve all the time. But sometimes it was okay to ask for help. Thanks, man. I really appreciate that, Alex said. This is your five a day. We are on week 2.2. First on today's list, we have an idiom. To batten down the hatches. To batten down the hatches. This means to prepare for a difficult or challenging situation. This comes from sailing on the ocean. It's something that you would hear in nautical terms. For example, as the storm approached, the captain ordered the crew to batten down the hatches. Now, as someone who lived on a ship for two years, I certainly experienced a couple of occasions where I was ordered to batten down the hatches where I had to release this very heavy hatch, this door that would go over and reinforce the little porthole, the little window in the side of the ship. And we would do that when it was stormy to stop the windows being broken by the waves crashing against the side of the ship. But we use this metaphorically, of course. We might say, OK, things are going to be rough, so let's batten down the hatches. Maybe if you are about to enter a storm at work, if you know you're, you're going to be in for difficult times, a rumour is about to be released, perhaps something is going to go in the newspapers or you're going to send out a newsletter letting people know about something that you no is going to cause upset, then you might be warned to batten down the hatches to prepare yourself. Okay, next on our list is anchor. Anchor. Can you notice a theme <laughs> emerging here? Yes, these are all nautical phrases. 
It's a ship theme today. So anchor, this is a noun. It can also be a verb, but we're treating it as a noun today. An anchor is a heavy object used to prevent a boat from moving. So when a boat comes into the dock and it wants to stop for a little while, it will usually drop its anchor down to the ground or the seabed so that the ship stays where it is and the tide doesn't carry it out. An example sentence. The boat's anchor was stuck on a rock on the seabed. Next on our list we have embark. Embark. To embark on something. This is a verb. When it comes to the sea and ships, to embark means to board a ship or boat... Um, but it can also mean, in general, to start a journey. So I embarked on a journey. Example, we will embark on our journey to the Caribbean tomorrow. Woohoo! Next on our list, very easy to remember, is disembark. Can you guess what this means? To disembark is a verb meaning to leave a ship or a boat, to get off it. For example... After two weeks at sea, we finally disembarked in New York. And the final phrase on our list today is to run aground. To run aground. If you run aground, this means your boat or your ship has hit the bottom of the ocean. So if the water is very shallow and you hit the ground while you're sailing along then you have run aground. As I'm sure you can imagine, it's not good to run aground when you're sailing. An example sentence, the boat ran aground on a sandbank and got stuck. I'm glad to say I've never experienced running aground when, uh, during, my time, during my time at sea. Okay, that was my five... So let me give you those again. To batten down the hatches. Anchor. Embark and disembark. And number five was run aground. Now let's bring all of those together in a travel agent's article. Embarking on a cruise is an exciting adventure filled with endless opportunities for fun and relaxation. As you board the ship, you can feel the anticipation building. You find your room. You take a moment to settle in before heading out to explore the many activities available on board. As the ship pulls away from the dock, you can feel the excitement build. The gentle rocking of the ship is soothing as you make your way to the deck to take in the stunning ocean views. The captain's voice comes over the loudspeaker, Button down the hatches, we're in for some rough seas ahead. Despite the stormy weather, the onboard entertainment continues. From comedy shows to live music performances, there is never a dull moment on a cruise ship. And if you need a break from the action, you can always head to the spa or lounge by the pool. As the ship approaches its next port of call, you can prepare to disembark and the ship drops anchor. The excitement of exploring a new destination is palpable. However, not every cruise goes as planned. Sometimes a ship may run aground, causing unexpected delays. But even in these situations, the crew works tirelessly to ensure the safety and comfort of their passengers. No matter the destination or the unexpected twists and turns, Cruising is an exhilarating experience filled with adventure, relaxation and fun. So set sail and explore. This is your English 5 a day. We are on week 2.3. Number one on today's list is a bit of a smelly one, I'm afraid. It is a noun and it is halitosis. Halitosis. Say it with me. Halitosis. <laughs> Did you hear the breath? Halitosis. Halitosis means bad breath. 
So if someone tells you you have halitosis, then they're saying, Phew, your breath stinks. Here's an example sentence. He had such bad halitosis that people avoided talking to him. Oh dear. All right, straight on to number two. This is a verb and it is exfoliate. Exfoliate. To exfoliate is to remove dead skin or rather dead skin cells from the surface of your skin. So it's good to exfoliate to allow your skin to breathe and be nice and fresh and look lovely. I don't really exfoliate very often, but uh, when I had time to pamper myself, I did exfoliate on a regular basis. Here's an example sentence. She exfoliates her skin twice a week to keep it smooth and healthy. Number three, I nearly jumped ahead there. Number three is an adjective and it is sweaty. Sweaty. If you are sweaty, then you are wet. Your skin is wet and potentially a bit smelly because of sweat. So when you are too hot or when you work hard and your core temperature goes up, then your body sweats. It releases moisture in order to cool you down. And therefore, I would look at you and describe you as sweaty. We all become a little sweaty at times. During a heat wave, we might be sweaty. I'm sometimes sweaty in the night. I wake up all sweaty because of hormones and getting too hot under the blankets. If I go to the gym, I get quite sweaty. So um, you might hear someone refer to you as sweaty Betty. In fact, there is a gym clothing brand an active wear brand called Sweaty Betty's. Sweaty Betty's. Uh, Sweaty Betty used to be an unpleasant little name that you would use to tease someone who's quite sweaty. If someone smells of body odor, you'd say, oh, look at Sweaty Betty over there. She's a bit stinky, isn't she? I never said things like that because I'm not that kind of person. But I have heard that lots of times during my years at school. Okay, moving on to number four. A phrase, mundane tasks, mundane tasks. Mundane tasks are things that you have to do regularly. For example, doing the laundry, paying your bills, um, cleaning the house, brushing your teeth. These are all boring, regular things that we have to do. Example sentence, taking care of ourselves means regularly performing mundane tasks. And number five on our list is deodorant. Deodorant. This is a noun and it's something that you would need if you are quite sweaty. Deodorant is a substance that you either spray or wipe onto your skin, usually under the arms, so into your armpit, And this prevents or hides body odour. So an antiperspirant deodorant stops you from sweating or is supposed to reduce your sweat reaction. (laughs) And a deodorant basically is a smell, a nice smell that masks your sweat smell. Okay, so I will put on deodorant every day and straight after a shower or a bath to make sure that I don't stink. And if I do happen to be quite sweaty during the day, then I might go and refresh my body odour with a spray of deodorant under the arms. Example sentence. He forgot to put on deodorant and regretted it when people started avoiding him due to his strong odour. phew Okay, that was our five. Let me just recap. We had halitosis, exfoliate, sweaty, mundane tasks, deodorant. Now let's bring them all together in a little story. Samantha was excited about her date with Mark. She spent the whole day getting ready taking care of her skin by exfoliating and making sure she smelled nice with her special deodorant. 
However, as the night progressed, she couldn't help but notice Mark's bad breath. Ooh, which was so bad it reminded her of her grandpa's halitosis. The restaurant they went to was crowded and hot, and Mark was really sweaty. Beads of sweat kept dripping off his nose and onto the table, making Samantha feel uncomfortable. Mark also spent the evening complaining about his mundane tasks at work, making the date feel even longer. Despite Samantha's efforts, the date didn't go as planned, and she couldn't wait to get home and forget all about it. This is your English five a day. This is week 2.4. Wow, it's Thursday already. Well, if you're following this from Monday to Friday and this is the fourth day of the week, then it's Thursday for you, but perhaps not. Either way, this week is going very fast. They do say that time flies when you're having fun and if that's the case, then let me not waste any more time and jump straight into today's list. The first word on our list is luxurious. Say it with me, luxurious. You hear that lovely vibrating zh in the middle? I always think that this is like a French sound, zh, 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 luxurious. This is an adjective which means that something is of very high quality. Usually it's going to be expensive. For example, if I bought myself a night in a luxurious hotel, then I would expect there to be a mint on my pillow. I would expect feather pillows and very nice linen on my bed. I would expect the bathroom to be beautiful and the decor to be just gorgeous, the kind of place that I'd want to be all the time. I'd expect impeccable service and perhaps, you know, you arrive and there's a, a bottle of champagne waiting for you in your room. <laughs> I always used to have this theory that it was a good hotel if they offered hot chocolate alongside the coffee and tea that they put into your room. But <laughs> that goes to show my level of luxury. Anyway, so luxurious is something of high quality or expensive. If I bought myself a luxurious coat, it would be a coat that is very expensive, very well made, using some of the best materials, and I would feel wonderful while wearing it. Do you have anything that's luxurious? Okay, so... Here's an example sentence. The setting for her private show was luxurious. Number two on the list is flamboyantly. Flamboyantly. This is an adverb. So if you do something flamboyantly, then you do it with a very confident manner. You do it in a very confident way, usually in a way that gets you noticed by people. For example, <laughs> if I am feeling frustrated and I want people to see that I'm frustrated, I might throw myself to the floor flamboyantly. <laughs> I might throw my arms up in the air flamboyantly and be like, oh, I'm just so annoyed. That would be quite flamboyant. Although, to be honest, I often think of flamboyant in a very positive way. You might dress flamboyantly. So you may wear very colourful clothes or things with very strong patterns or perhaps match together items of clothing that people wouldn't wear ordinarily because they're so bright or because they clash. That would be a flamboyant way to dress. Here's an example sentence. The dancer paraded flamboyantly around the stage. Next, we have the noun frivolity. Frivolity. If you are frivolous or if you have frivolity, then you have a lack of seriousness. You behave in a silly way. We often talk about frivolity or being frivolous when it comes to money 
or resources if you don't use them in a serious way. So for example, you might say, the audience acted with such frivolity that it was hard for the singer to concentrate on her performance. So the audience were so silly and weren't taking the performance serious. They weren't taking their role as audience member serious enough and it made it hard for the performer to do her job. Number four on our list, another noun, decadence. Decadence. Now, decadence describes low moral standards and behaviour. Think of self-indulgence. Someone who acts with an air of decadence would be someone who uses the people around them, who takes what they want and doesn't give anything back, who doesn't care for the mess that they leave behind, who doesn't care for the environmental impacts, who doesn't care how many people they're hurting or, you know, what moral standards they are going against. They just do what they want to do. They act in a selfish way. That is decadence and it often leads to kind of social decay. <laughs> Moving on from that slightly negative note. Number five, an expression, glitz and glamour glitz and glamour. This is usually something that makes an impression because it's flashy and gorgeous and glamorous. So we talk about the glitz and glamour of a room or glitz and glamour of an event. For example, if you are going to a red carpet event, like a premiere of a film, and there are Lots of celebrities all wearing their beautiful outfits. The ladies are in sparkly gowns and the gentlemen are in their tuxedos and their wonderful designer suits and everyone's turning up in these amazing supercars. There are paparazzi, click, 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 click everywhere. And that would be a glitzy and a glamorous event. So you'd say the glitz and glamour of the premiere brought all the paparazzi in. Or another example is the glitz and glamour of the ballroom was out of this world in a ballroom. I always think of those mirror balls. They often have mirror balls attached to the ceiling that spin around and there will be a light shining onto the mirror ball, which then cascades light. Well, cascade is not probably the right word, but it spreads these tiny lights, it reflects these lights all around the room. So it looks like you're among the stars and they're moving around the room. It's fabulous. I love a mirror ball. I love the glitz and glamour of the ballroom specifically because of the mirror ball. <laughs> okay, that was our five. Let's just do a quick recap. We had luxurious. What does luxurious mean? It means of high quality and expensive. We had flamboyantly. Can you remember this one? It means to act in a very confident way, in a way that people will notice you. Then we had frivolity, to be frivolous. Frivolity, it means to lack seriousness and to have silly behaviour. Then we had decadence. This is self-indulgence low moral standards and behaviour. And then we finished with the expression, can you remember? Glitz and glamour. Glitz and glamour. Okay, that was our five. Let's bring them all together with a little story. In the dimly lit clubs of her youth, Marianne never dreamt that one day she'd be surrounded by such luxurious splendour. From rags to riches, she had worked hard to be here, always acting with determination. Flamboyantly dressed in a sequined gown, here she now stood beneath the glittering chandeliers, the definition of success. Oh, the frivolity of those early days. She spent many a night singing her heart out, striving to escape her poverty. Every note was a lifeline, every melody a ray of hope. With a voice that possessed the power to cross the boundaries that shackled her, and a heart full of passion, Marianne ventured forth into a world teeming with possibility. 
With each step she took, the decadence of her surroundings grew more distinct. The air was thick with ambition, mingled with the scent of champagne and the allure of glamour. The world welcomed her, embracing her with open arms as if to say, You've arrived, darling. Bask in the glitz and glamour that is now yours to behold. However, Marianne never forgot her humble beginnings. The memory of worn-out shoes and threadbare dresses danced in the corners of her mind, a constant reminder of the journey she had undertaken. Hello, welcome back to the English Like a Native podcast. This is your English Five a Day. I'm Anna and this episode is 2.5. It's Friday, if you're following this chronologically through the week. Today, 2.5, we have reached the end of our second week. So I am excited to introduce five new words. Well, the last one is a cluster. (laughs) Let's go. Number one, bestow. Bestow. This is a verb. Say it with me. Bestow. Bestow. It's not a brand of gravy. The brand of gravy is Bisto. Bisto. (laughs) This is slightly different. Listen to the stress. Bisto. Bisto. This means to give something as an honour or a present. So if I bestow upon you something, then I've given you something like a gift or an honour. I always think of royalty and aristocracy when I hear this verb, because the queen will often bestow something. For example, you might say, the queen bestowed upon him the honour of a knighthood. Okay, so it's a very, um, it's a very, I don't want to say the word posh, but I'm going to say the word posh because I've said it now. It's quite a posh word, meaning to give. So to bestow upon someone, something. Okay, next on our list is a noun and it is clasp. Say that with me, clasp, that nice long R vowel in the middle, clasp. What is a clasp, Anna? As a noun, a clasp will refer to a metal device that fastens a belt or a bag or a necklace or a bracelet perhaps. So the clasp is the bit that fastens, the little mechanism that fastens it. Okay, you might have heard clasp as a verb to clasp something. And that means to hold something tightly. So think of a clasp as a device that holds. For example, the dog jumped up at the young woman, catching his paw on her bracelet and breaking the clasp. I always find the clasp on like necklaces or particularly on bracelets actually quite difficult to do by myself, particularly on a bracelet because you're actually holding one hand still as you put the bracelet on that hand. And so doing a clasp on a bracelet can be quite tricky. You often need someone to come and help you. Okay, number three on the list is pendant. Pendant. So a pendant As a noun, a pendant is an item of jewellery that often hangs around your neck. And it consists of a chain and an object. Okay, so it would be like a necklace that has an object hanging on a chain. That is a pendant. For example, I want to wear my silver pendant tonight. It goes nicely with the neckline of my dress. Next, we have the word engrave. Engrave. This is a verb and it means to cut words or symbols into metal or stone. So it's like writing permanently on metal or on stone. Obviously, it's very difficult to write on stone. I guess you could with a permanent marker. You could write with ink on it. But if you want the the symbol or the words that you write to last for a long time, then you would engrave, you would 
physically cut the words into the stone. Now, we often have our jewellery engraved. If you are bestowing a gift upon a, an employee who's worked for your company for a long time, you might engrave it with their name and a message and perhaps the date or the length of time that they've served the company so that they can remember their time and remember what that item signifies. I had a ring given to me once that was engraved. I mean, it's amazing how they can engrave such a teeny tiny band of metal. But I think machines do it mostly now. But in the past, things were hand engraved. I would be terrible at that job because I'm always making spelling errors. <laughs> I can imagine if I was an engraver, I would just lose so much money in materials because I'd have to start again and start again and start again. But just, yeah, not a good job for me. So let me give you an example sentence. We have discovered a watch with the name Edward engraved on the back. Oh, ooh. OK, last on our list is an adjective and the adjective is 18 karat gold. Now, this basically describes the purity or the finesse of gold or gemstones. It's like a measurement. So if I'm going to go and buy a gold pendant or a gold ring... You might ask me, what carrot are you going to, you know, spend a lot of money and get a really good gold ring? So it would be, you know, a, a higher carrot of gold, or is it going to be lower quality, lower purity? So it would be a lower carrot of gold. 18 carat gold is quite good, I think. I'm not an expert when it comes to jewellery. But yes, it's a measurement for the purity of gold or gemstones. Now, carrot can be spelled with a K or a C. In the UK, we often use a C, carrot, but both are acceptable spellings in this country. Here's an example sentence. My husband gave me an 18 carat gold necklace for our anniversary. And there were our five. I'm going to repeat the list. Repeat them after me. We had bestow, clasp, pendant, Engrave 18 karat gold. Bestow means to gift or to give an honour to someone. Clasp is a noun for a device that holds and fastens things like belts. A pendant is an item of jewellery that hangs around the neck consisting of a chain and an object. Engrave is the action of cutting words or symbols into metal or stone. And 18 karat gold is an adjective that is a measurement of the purity of gold or gemstones. Fantastic. So now let's bring all of those words together in a story. The old woman clasped the pendant in her hand. It was a simple piece of jewellery made of 18 karat gold and engraved with the initials of her beloved husband. He had given it to her on their wedding day and she had worn it every day since. Now, as she lay dying, she wanted to bestow the pendant on her granddaughter. She knew that her granddaughter would cherish it as much as she had. She called her granddaughter to her bedside and handed her the pendant. This is for you, she said. I want you to have it. The granddaughter took the pendant and held it in her hands. Thank you, she said. I will never take it off. The old woman smiled. I know you won't, she said. The old woman died a few days later, and her granddaughter wore the pendant every day after that, and it served as a reminder of her grandmother's love. And that wraps up our five a day for week two. I do hope you found this week's episodes useful. And if you're not already supporting the podcast, but you're enjoying it, then please do support us by leaving a rating or review so that other listeners can find us. 
And you could also go a step further by becoming a Plus member. Learn all about the benefits of Plus membership in the show notes. Thank you for joining. Until next time, take care and goodbye.